last time, which was with a general discussion of social categories. Sorry about that. It doesn't seem to be helping much. Anyway, um, social categorization ought to be a fairly straightforward kind of thing. Uh, Roger Brown, when he tried to identify natural categories of persons, came up with fairly straightforward concepts like sex and race and nationality and, so, uh, and uh, the kinship that on the surface look very straightforward, but when you start thinking about them a little bit, it turns out not to be so straightforward. So, for example, the most, it would seem to be the most natural thing in the world that you divide people up into sex, male and female, and that that categorization would tell you an awful lot about them. Um, but it turns out it doesn't tell you that much at all. Uh, you've got to you take into consideration not just biological sex. You have to take into consideration gender identity. You have to take into consideration gender role. You have to take into consideration sexual orientation. And pretty soon you've got not two categories pertaining to gender, but you've got, in principle, a couple of hundred categories pertaining uh, to, uh, uh, to gender. And that's kind of the way things go. And there's, a, and there's a rule here, which is that the boundaries between various social categories are not all that clear, and also that the, nature, the very definition of social categories can change from time to time and from place to place. Uh, let's just remind ourselves what we're talking about here. There are lots of different kinds of social categories. Uh, we're going to talk mostly in this uh, in these set of, set of lectures about classes of persons, which are typically represented by noun terms, terms like male or female, man or woman. Okay? Um, we have also categories of social groups, which I'm going to talk about mostly on Monday, but I hope to talk about psychiatric diagnoses today. But there are also categories of situations. If somebody invites you to a particular kind of party, for example, and you don't really know what goes on there, They'll try to describe it in terms of something you already know. If you get invited to your Jewish roommate's little brother's bar mitzvah, and you say, well, what's that? He'll, he might say, well, it's kind of like a christening, or it's kind of like a confirmation ceremony, or it's kind of like quinceanera, or something like that. And that kind of gives you the idea that it's a kind of coming of age ceremony. And you kind of know what to expect. Okay? Uh, we also classify actions especially social interactions in terms of uh, the, the categories. And that gives us this whole big vocabulary of trait adjectives. We classify some behaviors as instances of aggression, other behaviors as instances of friendliness, and so on and so forth. And we also have a, 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 um, a related set of categories that pertain to social interactions. Again, we're going to focus mostly uh, in these lectures on categories of persons, but I want you to be uh, just, just kind of be aware that categorization goes from soup to nuts in the social world. It's not just people we're classifying. It's behaviors and situations and all sorts, uh, all sorts of other things. Okay. Uh, here's another one of Roger Brown's um, uh, natural categories of persons. Uh, classification of people into occupations. If you go and take a sociology course on social stratification, or uh, you take an epidemiology course on social class and, uh, and health, you'll typically see a, socio a, a ranking of socioeconomic status like this that takes into account people's occupations and their level of education and their level of, uh, of income. And sociologists will commonly classify people as white collar or blue collar. They'll classify white collar employees as professional versus managerial, sometimes sales. They'll classify blue collar employees as skilled versus unskilled, and so on and so forth. That's a fairly obvious uh, the scheme of, uh, of classification of people by virtue of their occupations. And if somebody says, well, I'm going to introduce you to this person. He's a professional. You had some idea what to expect. Your expectations may be frustrated or disappointed in various ways, but by virtue of identifying the person with a category, you have some idea what to expect. And again, 
although this is the kind of uh, the classification of occupations that um, scientific sociologists and economists tend to prefer, there are all sorts of other classifications by occupation that you encounter uh, that are culturally specific. So there's nothing natural about these categories. If you move to another culture, you might get an, an entirely different uh, classification of occupations. A good example of this is the caste system in Hindu India, something that is technically illegal now in India, but still a prominent feature of, uh, of Indian uh, social life, where you have at the, at the upper end of the, uh, of the occupation categories, uh, Brahmins, who are typically priests and scholars, uh, and then down at the bottom, um, on, on, untouchables and all sorts of levels in, uh, in between. Again, this is how in Hindu India, especially traditional Hindu India, you would classify people. And it doesn't look very much like uh, the kind of occupational categories that we get, um, that we get from sociologists. Okay, political categories, same way. Uh, you go home for, for, for the holidays and your mother uh, uh, asks you what your roommate's like and say, well, you know, we're not really getting along because he's a Democrat or whatever. Again, labeling people, classifying people as Democrats or Republicans, neoconservatives versus paleoconservatives, and so on, provides information about that person. What it says is you can expect this person to be like other people who belong in this class. And again, I just want to point out that the nature of these social categories is not given once and for all. The distinction between liberals and conservatives didn't exist until roughly 1780 uh, in, the, in, in, in the West, and it's changed a lot uh, since then. The distinction between neoconservatives and paleoconservatives didn't begin to emerge until the 1960s or 1970s, and it's a distinction that you really only find only in American politics. You won't find it in British politics. You won't find it in French politics uh, or uh, or any place else. Uh, and of course, uh, times, uh, times change. Communist used to be a big political category. No, not so much. Okay? So again, these are not given once and for all. These are very fluid kinds of categories that change from time to time. Uh, nationality uh, the, uh, the categories is another really good example. How would we divide people up in sensible ways, classifying them according to nationality? Um, very often you'll find a fundamental distinction between people of European origin and people of Asian origin, uh, but uh, we make distinctions between Western and Eastern European uh, individuals, between Northern and Southern, more Germanic, more Italian, between Anglo-Irish and Continental. The, the Anglo-Irish sometimes don't even consider themselves European because they're not on the continent, and there are certain Europeans, like the French, who don't consider them European either for exactly that same reason. Again, uh, the point of view makes a, makes a big difference in terms of how you slot people into categories. Here's one I was discussing uh, at, uh, that, that, uh, with, with some people at the end of the last class. The whole question of defining somebody as Jewish or not Jewish is one that turns out to be pretty, uh, pretty interesting and pretty difficult. You'd think it might be fairly straightforward, but it turns out, uh, it turns out not to be. Traditionally, uh, uh, the, the Jewishness is defined in terms of matrilineal descent. If you're the child of a Jewish mother, you're, uh, you're Jewish. Uh, but people do convert to Judaism, uh, and it turns out it makes a difference whether you have a so-called orthodox conversion or a non-orthodox conversion, a point I'll return to um, at the, uh, 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 in a moment. But Orthodox Jews won't, con won't consider anybody who's converted to Judaism a Jew unless he's had an Orthodox conversion. Okay? Similarly, you can convert from Judaism. It happens sometimes that a Jewish person will become Buddhist or Christian or uh, Muslim or something like that. But again, in Orthodox doctrine, as long as you're the child of a Jewish mother, you're still Jewish, no matter what your religious uh, belief uh, uh, is. There's the issue of the so-called lost tribes of Israel, like the Ethiopian uh, Falasha, um, uh, a, uh, a, an issue that comes to, uh, that comes to a, a head in Israel because of the Israeli law of return, which gives any Jewish person 
the right to emigrate to Israel. These are Ethiopians who claim um, to, to, to be Jewish. They practice uh, the, the Judaism, and they've also and, and they've claimed their uh, their right of uh, right of return. And then there is the, the, the question of whether Judaism is a uh, is a religious based class religion based classification or an ethnicity based classification. There is a fascinating case in the British courts right now of a young man named, uh, who, who's, who's known as M to, pre to protect his, um, uh, his uh, um, identity, his, 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 his privacy. In England, there are several thousand religion-based public schools. Okay? That is, there are schools that cater to members of a particular religion, but which receive public financing. Okay, that's just the way the English have organized um, their, uh, their system. And M uh, is a practicing uh, a, a Jewish young man, a uh, child of a Jewish mother, who uh, applied for, um, for admission to one of these religious schools that is, or that, that is organized for Jews. He was denied admission to the school because his mother converted to Judaism when she married, but she didn't have an orthodox conversion. So the school denied that M was Jewish because his mother wasn't Jewish as far as they were concerned, uh, even though M practices as a Jew. It's not just that he identifies as a kind of cultural Jew, the way some of us identify ourselves as cultural Christians, um, but he actually is a practicing devout uh, uh, the, uh, the Jewish person. And that denial led the British court system to say, hey, wait a minute, we're, made, we're willing to make a, a, an accommodation for religion, but we're not willing to make an accommodation for ethnicity. And if you're going to define who's a Jew by virtue of descent instead of by religious belief, then you've got Judaism being an ethnic category, not a religious category, and these schools don't, don't, don't deserve any public support. So again, how you categorize these things makes a big difference. Those of you who've had, uh, who had introductory psychology with me know that there's a famous Supreme Court, American Supreme Court decision that classifies a tomato as a vegetable. Okay, um, Because we think of it as a vegetable, even though it's not a vegetable, right? And it, there it is enshrined in this law, uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court decision from the 1880s, um, that, uh, that, that tomatoes are vegetables, not fruits. Uh, it kind of seems silly at the time, but it's the same kind of question is be, uh, uh, that being raised uh, in, the, in, the, in this particular British court case. It's quite interesting. Uh, now. Here's another example, the question of who's French. In French constitutional law, anybody born in France or born in a French territory until very recently was considered French. And that's all you are in France. Uh, France doesn't make any further uh, distinctions. In France, they don't have any idea how many uh, Frenchmen of African descent there are or French Muslims or anything else because France doesn't allow that kind of classification of, uh, uh, of people. Um, uh, the, but this idea that there's one kind of Frenchman and, ever, and, all, and all Frenchmen are equal is really quite extreme. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, and Hillary Clinton, both of whom were born in former French territories, Bill Clinton, born in Arkansas, uh, Hillary Clinton, born in Illinois, were, were eligible to become presidents of France. Okay, just kind of imagine that for a second, because that's the definition of, 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 of the French. As soon, by the way, as soon as the French found out that Bill Clinton was eligible, eligible to become president of France, they changed that law. Um, and it's not, uh, it, 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 it's not true anymore. But, you know, here's your kind of prototypical French president, Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle, get it? Charles the Frenchman, right? Who's the president of France now? Nicolas Sarkozy. He's a Hungarian, right? Um, but because he was born in France, he's considered a Frenchman. Right now, there's a big uh, controversy in France about the wearing of the hijab, the headscarf, by devout um, um, Muslim women. And somehow, uh, the, uh, many French policymakers are very unhappy about this 
because it seems to be making distinctions among the French, right? And somehow, if you want to wear the headscarf, you're not as French as other people who don't want to wear the headscarf. You're setting yourself apart or whatever. So much so that France has now banned the wearing of the headscarf in certain public places. Uh, a, kind of, a kind of radical thing. But again, the point here is that it's not completely clear who's French, right? And it's not completely clear how you get to be um, uh, the French. These social categories are not like whether you're a fish or a, uh, or, a, or a bird or whatever, or are they? A question we'll come back to uh, in a couple of minutes. Here's another one. Hits a little bit closer to home. What's an American? Um, uh, American political ideology has usually been based on this idea of the melting pot. This is the play by Israel Zangwill that uh, that, that term uh, that comes from, that somehow people come to the shores of America, whether they're Hungarians or Frenchmen or black or white or whatever, and we're all kind of put in this God's crucible, uh, the melting pot, and out comes a blend uh, that, in, in which everybody's lost their individual identities. Well, not so much. Uh, anymore. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of uh, the racial or ethnic groups who are uh, uh, arguing that you know, there's not just one kind of American, there are lots of different kinds of Americans, and instead of being a, um, uh, in, 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 instead of being one big melting pot, American society is more of a mosaic or a rainbow or a stew or, or, or something like that. This, the, this point of view on what, on, on what it means to be an American turns out to have certain kinds of consequences uh, for, uh, for people. There are now two political ideologies at play in American society, one which we could call assimilationism, which emphasizes the idea of, Ameri of, of America as a melting pot that tries to get rid of differences between people, and the other one, a kind of multiculturalism uh, that tries to celebrate differences and, uh, and encourages uh, members of different ethnic groups to retain their identities and their traditions and things like that. Uh, Nathan Glazer and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, two sociologists writing in the 1960s in their book uh, Beyond the Melting Pot, uh, uh, drew attention to the fact that melting pot is kind of an ideology in American society, but it didn't really happen. And there are now a bunch of the uh, alternate American metaphors uh, that, have been, uh, that have been proposed. Nathan Glazer, writing 35 years later, says, we're all multiculturalists now uh, in, in, uh, in the United States. Well, we're not all multiculturalists, that's for sure. But in American society, the debate between assimilationist ideology and multiculturalist ideology is very much the same kind of debate over what it means to be an American that Israelis have over what it means to be a Jew and that Frenchmen have over what it means to be um, uh, a, uh, a Frenchman. Uh, here's a recent work by Victoria Plout, who's a professor here up in the law school, um, looking at uh, what, what she calls diversity climate in various kinds of organizations. She went into a large organization with a number of different departments and assessed the white people in, the, the white employees in this department about um, their views about assimilationism versus multiculturalism. Uh, the idea, do you believe that, uh, that people should erase their ethnic differences when they become Americans, or do you think that America should celebrate ethnic differences? That's kind of a dimension of, uh, of belief. And classified whites into either multiculturalists, people who think you ought, to, you ought to encourage and celebrate ethnic diversity, or whites as colorblind, in uh, uh, people who think that they ought to erase all these, uh, all these differences. Then Professor Plout went to minorities employed in these same departments and looked at their psychological engagement with the firm, that, that is the amount, uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, positive feeling they have uh, with the firm, and also their perceptions of racial and, uh, and ethnic bias. And it turns out that um, minorities in departments where the white people tend to hold multicultural views are a lot happier and a lot more engaged in the firm, whereas minorities in departments where whites tend to um, uh, want to diminish ethnic, uh, ethnic differences 
uh, tend to perceive a lot, uh, a lot more bias and a lot, uh, uh, be a lot less psychologically engaged. So again, how you think about this question has consequences not just for you, but also has consequences for other people around you and, uh, and how comfortable they're going, to, uh, they're going to be. Okay, so let's now take a look at these kinds of racial and ethnic classifications that we have in the United States. And again, uh, there's kind of a straightforward um, uh, w w way of thinking about this. We tend to classify people as white or black, uh, as Hispanic, as Native American, as Asian. Uh, what's interesting about that is classify people as Asians. You glom together people who really don't see themselves as similar at all, South Asians, East Asians, and Southeast Asians, and then Pacific Islanders uh, are kind of uh, um, in there as well, and that includes Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians and, uh, and so on. But let's just look at how the racial and ethnic class, the official racial and ethnic classification in the United States has changed over its history by looking at the racial and ethnic categories employed in the United States Census. For 60 years, from the first census in 1790 until 1850, the census made really only three distinctions. First, a, dis a distinction between white and black. Those are the terms used uh, in the census. And uh, if you were black, uh, there was a further distinction between those who were free and those who were slaves. This is before the Civil War, uh, obviously. Um, but for the next uh, uh, 30, uh, three censuses, sensi, censuses, uh, 1850 to 1870, uh, you got, um, you got uh, a, a somewhat different kind of uh, the racial and ethnic classification. First, there's a, uh, a white or black, but now there's a subcategory of blacks known as mulattoes for people who are partly white and partly uh, black, uh, reflecting the interests of the westward expansion. We now, American Indians enter the census for the first time. Now, let's, get, let's be clear. There were American Indians back here, too. Right? But nobody cared about them. Then, okay, it was only with the westward expansion that that became a, a, a social category that people wanted to, uh, wanted to use. And there was a further distinction between uh, Indians who were taxed, that is, Indians who did not live on reservations, uh, and, uh, and, and those who weren't. Uh, ch uh, Chinese was added to the, the, the census in 1960 and Japanese was added to the census in 1970. There were Chinese and Japanese in the United States before then, uh, but they weren't, uh, they weren't officially counted in the census. Okay, in 1890, we get something different. Um, here, here are the, the, the categories then. Again, these are exactly the terms that the, um, that the census used. Uh, whites versus blacks, and blacks were further uh, classified as mulattoes, one white parent, one black parent, Quadroons, one black grandparent, and octoroons, one black great-grandparent. Again, you can see how race becomes very, very, very important in uh, re post-Reconstruction uh, the United States in a way that it wasn't before. We're making all these distinctions about black folk, uh, but we're not changing the distinctions about American Indians or Chinese or, uh, or Japanese. In 1910, all those black distinctions disappear from the census, and we add Asians for Asians who are not either Chinese or Japanese, and we add Pacific Islanders uh, for the first time. Why 1910? The Spanish-American War, right? Okay, Spanish-American War. We got Philippines. We, uh, we got the Philippines. So we ha and, and some other territories as well. So now we had to start counting um, uh, the Pacific Islanders. And the story kind of keeps going. We add Mexicans for the first time in, 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 in 1930. And we do that because there was a program known as the Bracero Program, which brought Mexican laborers across the border to work in uh, farms in the Midwest and the, uh, and the Southwest. And they started having children. So um, uh, uh, we wanted to know the, the, the census wanted to know how many, uh, how many people of Mexican heritage uh, we had. Um, Mexico, Mexican gets changed to white Hispanic in the 1940 census. It's not clear why they did that, but they did it. Um, adding Filipino as a separate category in 1950. Why 1950? World War II's over. A lot of Filipinos emigrating to the United, uh, United States. And then for the first time, we have a category of other race, 
not clear what that's supposed to uh, mean. 1960s, we start counting Eskimos, Aleuts, and Hawaiians for the first time. Why? 1958, Alaska and Hawaii enter the Union as states. Okay. 1970, we start making, uh, we start counting Koreans uh, separately. And a very interesting thing uh, starts to happen with people of Spanish uh, the descent, however you might think of them. The census has never been able to figure out how to categorize Americans of Hispanic um, uh, uh, origin. We, we saw earlier a, a category of Mexican, then that was re, uh, um, replaced with, there it is, white Hispanic, okay. Uh, now they try out this one, <laughs> Spanish language or heritage. You know, so if you, if, if, if you, uh, if your native language was Spanish or you considered yourself to be of Spanish heritage or Spanish origin or Spanish descent, you were supposed to check that category. Of course, that covers a multitude of different kinds of people and really um, obscures distinctions that you might think would be very interesting, like the distinction between Cubans and, uh, and for that matter, people who came from Spain uh, and, uh, and Mexicans and other cent uh, Central and South Americans. Um, and they stuck with that for the 1980 and 1990 census, but now we added more refined categories of Asian and Pacific Islanders for 1990. And then finally, not finally, in, two, in, in 2000, we get a bifurcated racial and ethnicity question. Again, the census trying to figure out exactly how to count Hispanic people in a way that is both accurate and meaningful to, uh, to, uh, to Hispanics. Here, uh, in the 2000 census for the first time, the question was broken up into two questions. First, you had to say whether you were Spanish, Hispanic, or Latino. And then, regardless of your answer, you had to indicate your race. And the reason for this was uh, it wasn't, the, the, the old census didn't make it, but made it very difficult for Hispanics who also uh, uh, were of African American heritage to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to show that. Here again, we get the term African American being used uh, for, for, the, for the very first time. Now what happens in the 2010 census, the one you're going to complete in a couple of months, the Question, the question is framed pretty much the same way, except now the order of these things is, is, is reversed. The Hispanic community didn't want Spanish first, okay, because that's Spain and that's the old world and all of that. So now it's Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, and then you indicate your race. And for the first time in a long time, in fact, I think for the first time ever, um, and, uh, the term Negro was placed in the census, which got the African-American community all up in arms. But the reason they did that was that in the long form of the 2000 census, large numbers of older African-Americans didn't want to identify themselves as either black or African-American. They wanted to identify themselves as Negroes, uh, so they're, they're, able to, um, uh, they're able to do that in the 2001 uh, the census. Notice now the proliferation of other categories of, 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 of people. Again, you know, this just shows you how these, uh, how these social categories are very fluid and can change over time. Um, skipping this, let's bring it even closer to home and look at the racial and ethnic classifications used in the, at the University of California for, uh, for its admissions. From 1995 to 2005, we used just this uh, uh, seven or eight uh, the categories. These are the terms that were used and the order in which they were um, uh, uh, given. Um, in 2005, the admissions form started to acknowledge pressures for diversity on the University of California campuses by, um, by making um, uh, accommodations for not just East Indians and Filipinos and Japanese and Koreans and Chinese, but also other Asians um, uh, and also other uh, Spanish American or Latino uh, folks. That lasted until 2009. And now this is what happens when you fill out the University of California uh, admissions form. You have to find yourself in this uh, list of, uh, of categories. 
uh, because of there's a there's a student a student driven campaign called the Count Me In campaign. A, we want everybody counted, right? And that's there's nothing wrong with that. The point is these there's nothing natural about any of these categorizations. These are these are categorizations that are socially driven. They are socially constructed. They change with the nature of the society. They're a moving target, okay? And they're a moving target because the society itself is a moving target. Okay, let's go back to some more or less technical uh, 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 cognitive science here for a second and just remind you that it's one thing to try to identify what the categories are it's another thing to look at what the cognitive structure of these social categories are. And again, um, in the history of cognitive psychology and cognitive science, we can trace an evolution of, um, of, our, of our theories of categorization that goes somewhat like, the, uh, somewhat as follows. From the time of Aristotle, four or 500 BC, until very recently, roughly 1960, our, our ideas about categorization were dominated by an Aristotelian view of categories as proper sets. This is known as the classical view of categories. And the idea here is that every category is identified by a set of features that are singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define membership in the category. So to use an example from last Monday, Fish are cold-blooded vertebrates with, skins, uh, with, 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 with scales and fins. All fish have those four properties. If you've got those four properties, you're a fish. Okay? If you don't have those four properties, you're not a fish. Anything, uh, th th there's kind of no in-between. Okay? So that's the classical view. That view began to break down in the 1950s in, among philosophers, and especially after uh, in, in, in the 1970s, with the work of Berkeley's own Eleanor Roche, who single-handedly, with just paper and pencil, smashed 2,500 years of received wisdom about the nature of categories, a really unbelievably singular um, uh, intellectual achievement, and left us with uh, what's now known as the probabilistic view of categories, which says that there's no perfect association between some package of defining features and category membership, Rather, the features that, uh, that, that we uh, use to identify categories have only a probabilistic relationship uh, to, uh, to category membership. It's not the case. And if you look at how we mentally represent categories, it's not the case that um, the, uh, the features we think of as important to category membership are present in every instance of the category. They just tend to be more present in within the category than outside the category. Uh, the probabilistic view associated with, uh, with Professor Roche has been challenged in some quarters by what's known as an exemplar view, which basically says that what we carry around in our heads is not a list of characteristic features or even a list of defining features, uh, uh, but rather what we carry around in our heads is a list of category members. And when we want to assign objects to a category, we compare them to category members, not to some abstract, uh, abstract list. And then more recently, the, exempt, the, the probabilistic view and the exemplar view have been challenged by a view um, of, of concepts as theories, which basically says that we don't have anything like a list of features or a list of exemplars in our heads. What we have is kind of a theory that relates various features to uh, various category um, category membership, okay? So if you take a cognitive psychology course, which most of you have, or take a cognitive science course, you get this kind of history, and you know that the classical view is not empirically supported, uh, but that people tend to favor one or the other of these more, uh, more revisionist views. What's interesting is that you can see exactly this same kind of history repeat itself with respect to social categorization. Here is one very good uh, example, okay? Uh, the classical fourfold typology that uh, comes to us from, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, actually wrote a psychology text, okay? Really good, actually pretty good book, in which he divided people into four types, melancholics, 
cholerics, sanguines, and phlegmatics. Melancholics are kind of depressive types. Cholerics are kind of angry uh, types. Sanguine people are easygoing. And phlegmatic people are just kind of slow to get moving. They just, you know, not, don't care too much about, uh, about anything. And what Kant argued, uh, basically following uh, on, uh, on, on Hippocrates and Galen, founders, Greek and Roman founders of, of medicine, is that the whole world could be classified into these uh, into these four types of people based on, uh, based on their features. Uh, I won't read this to you. There's the disc Kant's description of the sanguine temperament, carefree and full of hope, melancholic, okay, um, discover everywhere cause for anxiety, notice the difficulties first, choleric temperament, hot-headed, okay, and phlegmatic, lacking emotion. Not laziness, just lacking uh, emotion. Now what happens when you, when you try to apply this, this uh, classification scheme, which looks kind of good at the outset, after all, it too lasted roughly 2,000 uh, 2, years, is that you find problems of partial expression and combined expression, which is to say there are people who just don't fit the category. They fall through the cracks uh, somehow. Uh, there are some people who are anxious and worried, but they're also high-principled and controlled. You don't know whether to classify them as phlegmatic or as, uh, as melancholic. This problem of partial and combined expression among personality types is exactly the problem we have um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in natural categorization, where we say, well, something's a typical car but, or, or not a typical automobile or whatever. So the problem is how to solve this. Well, one way to solve this, a solution uh, um, uh, uh, pr proposed by Wilhelm Wundt, one of the pioneering uh, 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 the psychologists in the 19th century, is to take a, a, uh, this categorical scheme, which says there are four different kinds of people, cholerics and melancholics or sanguines or phlegmatics, and turn that four-category uh, four scheme into a two-dimensional scheme in which people vary along two different continua. First, a, um, a continuum of strength of emotion. Melancholics and cholerics have very strong emotional states. Phlegmatics and sanguines have very weak emotional states. And also a dimension of speed of emotional arousal. Cholerics and sanguines change their mood very quickly. Sanguines don't have much mood to change, but when they do change their mood, they change very quickly whereas melancholics and phlegmatics are very slow to change. And Wundt, who appreciated this problem in the late 19th century, said, you get away from all the problems of trying to fit people into categories by getting rid of categories, okay? Um, you just turn, turn uh, your category scheme into two continuous dimensions, and now what we can do is we can take individuals and instead of locating each individual in some discrete category, what we can do is locate each individual as a point in a two-dimensional space, depending on how changeable your emotions are and how strong your emotions are. This is a variant on Roche's probabilistic uh, view of categorization, which Wundt uh, intuited in the late 19th century. So again, uh, the, uh, the, the point of this is that you can see in the social domain the same kinds of difficulties with the classical view of categorization that we find in the non-social domain and this Wundtian idea of getting rid of categories and turning them into dimensions uh, was, uh, was one approach to this. Okay, uh, so okay, you've got this two-dimensional space now where people vary, are held to vary on in terms of strength of emotional response and speed of emotional response. And what that means is that there's a prototypical, somewhere out there, there's a prototypical melancholic person who really does have all these traits to the extreme. He's worried and anxious and unhappy and suspicious and serious and thoughtful. And so you'd locate that person out here someplace. Here's a kind of prototypical uh, sanguine individual. He'd be located out here someplace, very far from these kinds of boundaries but other people could fall in between. They could have some features of melancholia, but some features of sanguinicity, 
whatever um, uh, it is. Um, uh, so you can mix and match your, your, uh, your categories. And you have to do that because people mix and match. The reason the, the classical fourfold scheme began to fall is that it didn't fit the actual empirical facts about people's personalities. Here's another example, okay? Psychiatric diagnosis is another way of categorizing people. people a, a patient comes to a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist and says, I'm having difficulties uh, the first thing you do in the medical model of mental health services delivery is make a diagnosis, okay? And when we make psychiatric diagnoses, what we're essentially doing is classifying the person as similar to some kinds of patients and different from other kinds of patients. So we say, well, your problem is you're schizophrenic or your problem is you're depressed. Now, sometimes we say the problem is you have schizophrenia, but that very quickly slips over into a kind of typological idea where you say, well, you, uh, what, you're, you, you go home and your husband says, what, did, the, what patients did you see today? And you say, well, I saw another typical schizophrenic. You classify people in terms of personality uh, uh, types. Here is uh, one view of the various major categories of mental illness. We make a distinction first between those who are normal and those who are mentally disturbed, and then we try to subclassify them in terms of the form of mental disturbance they have, uh, whether they have an organic brain syndrome or mental retardation or they're neurotic or psychotic uh, or whatever. This is just another way of classifying people. And the question is, how do we do it? How do people in the mental health field classify people according to uh, the various categories of uh, mental illness? Again, the point here is that making a psychiatric diagnosis is an act of classification. You're classifying a person in the same way that you would if you called him uh, a Hindu or a Christian or a, uh, or a neurotic or, uh, or an extrovert or whatever. Uh, these are, again, social, uh, the social labels. And the, symptom, the, the, the symptoms that the patient presents are kind of like features. Um, and the syndromes, schizophrenia, what have you, are categories. And we make psychiatric diagnosis by matching the symptoms that the patient presents to us to the symptoms that are known to be characteristic of various psychiatric diagnoses. And the rules for that are basically laid out in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, known as the DSM published by the American Psychiatric Association. If you've been reading the newspaper, you know that this is currently undergoing revision in very interesting, uh, very interesting ways. Okay, what's interesting about this is that at the beginnings of, psych of, of psychiatry, at the very beginnings of psychiatric diagnosis uh, from, the late, uh, from the late 19th century well up into uh, the, the middle of the 20th century, the psychiatric diagnoses were construed as proper sets in the same way that Aristotle construed ca categories as proper sets, where the symptoms of mental illness were treated as defining features, and what you did was you tried to match the patient's symptoms to the various diagnostic categories. So, for example, uh, the first thing you want to do, you would want to do then, is classify the patient as organic versus functional. Organic mental illnesses are associated with objective evidence of brain insult, injury, or disease. In functional mental illnesses, there's no evidence of, uh, of brain damage. Um, then you classify the person as psychotic versus neurotic. Psychotic if there's a problem in reality testing. Neurotic if there's a lot of anxiety. And then suppose you've classified the person as psychotic. The next decision you have to make is whether the person is schizophrenic versus manic depressive. And that's based basically on whether the patient's symptoms are cognitive in nature or emotional uh, in nature. Eugen Bloiler, the Swiss psychiatrist who first named schizophrenia as a form of mental illness, argued that all schizophrenics had four features in common what he called the four A's, association disturbance, a particular kind of thought disorder, anhedonia, not too much positive emotion, 
autism, by which he meant social withdrawal, and ambivalence, meaning that uh, there, 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 there were certain problems in motivation. But Bloiler claimed that every schizophrenic patient showed the four A's, and if you showed the four A's, you were schizophrenic. The four A's were singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define the category of schizophrenia. That's exactly the way Aristotle defined categories back in the, uh, in the, in the, fifth, century, uh, in the fifth century BC. The only problem with this is that as people started diagnosing schizophrenia, they, they uh, the, the quickly realized that thinking about psychiatric diagnoses as proper sets was no more satisfactory than thinking about personality types as proper sets. There were people who did, didn't fit, and there were a lot of people who didn't fit. There were people who had features of schizophrenia and features of manic depressive illness, that's not supposed to happen. Remember, in, according to the classical view, you're either in one category or the other. You can't be both a fish and a bird. Okay? You can't be both schizophrenic and manic depressive. And there were people who had some features of schizophrenia, but not all the features of schizophrenia. And there was a lot of to-do about exactly what to do about this. Okay? But there's the idea. Okay, once you've identified somebody as schizophrenic, then there were four subcategories of schizophrenia. Simple schizophrenia, if all you had was the four A's. Hebophrenic schizophrenic, try that one sometime. Uh, if you had child displayed childlike behavior. Catatonic schizophrenia, if you uh, assumed really strange postures. And paranoid schizophrenia, if you had delusions. It's a scheme of hierarchical classification that goes from superordinate category to subordinate category by adding new defining features at every stage. It makes a tremendous amount of sense on paper, and it simply doesn't work. Okay? So again, here's, this, here's the hierarchical organization of, 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 uh, of psychopathology. Um, again, all classified in terms of proper sets. What happened in 1994 was that these problems with the diagnostic system which stemmed entirely from the fact that the diagnostic categories were construed in classical terms as proper sets, was abandoned. Okay? And what the, um, what, the, uh, what, what the American Psychiatric Association did was essentially adopt, though they didn't give her credit, essentially adopt uh, a Rossian view of, uh, of, of classification in which now the various syndromes of mental illness are no longer identified in terms of defining features, which must be present, but rather in terms of characteristic features, which tend to be present. So now we, class, we can classify somebody as, uh, as, as, as schizophrenic if they have um, either something in category one or something in category two or something in category three. So if you have delusions and catatonia, okay. Uh, if you have flat affect and incoherence, okay. Uh, if you have bizarre delusions but, uh, uh, but uh, no catatonia or hallucinations, you're still schizophrenic. If you have hallucinations but no catatonia or delusions, again, what's happening here is that for the first time, beginning in 1994, was a recognition that not all schizophrenic patients were the same. They, they cluster into this category, but they're not all alike with respect to any set of singly necessary and jointly sufficient defining features. Okay, so now, again, you can be diagnosed with schizophrenia if you have any two of these. So there's a lot of heterogeneity within the category of schizophrenia. And that's true for all the psychiatric diagnoses now. So here, with respect to psychiatric diagnosis, we have a problem of social categorization, how to take the patient in front of you and classify him or her. And we've seen in the history of psychiatric diagnosis a retracing of the steps of the evolution of models of categorization from thinking about psychiatric diagnoses as proper sets to thinking about psychiatric diagnoses as fuzzy sets or something like that. Okay, that's that history.
What we'll do on Monday is we're going to take a close look at a particular form of social categorization known as stereotyping. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.